All right, so I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. We're right at 11 o'clock. Um, thank you everybody for uh, coming out. This is the second Law and Courts Brown Bag. Uh, this one's on the topic of uh, immigration law and politics. Uh, we have two papers uh, today. Uh, Rebecca Hamlin is our, uh, is our uh, discussant. Um, and I believe we could go in the order that we have the papers on the um, on the uh, um, on the poster. Um, and Rebecca, were you going to uh, comment after each paper and open it up, or how, how did you want to do the formatting for the discussions? I don't. I don't mind. I can. I have individual comments for each paper. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I can wait till they're both done and give comments to both and then dive into, you know. That sounds good. Sounds good to me. Yeah, either, either way is fine. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, I believe then our first paper is from uh, Maureen Straub and uh, Joshua Kennedy. So Maureen, it is yours. Go for it. Great. I'll share my screen. Wait, it's not working. That's weird. Hold on, it just worked a minute ago. Uh, okay, what's going on? I see the little thing saying it's starting to share. And then it weird. kind of peters out. Okay. We'll check that you have it. We'll that is it. strange. Every time I try to press on the Zoom, hold on. Mm -hmm here. Okay, David can verify that we just got this to work like a few minutes ago. So I don't know what's going on. Hold on. Do the same exact thing. Share screen. Okay, that worked, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, all can see. All right, so I'm presenting my paper with Joshua Kennedy titled Judicial Specialization and Deference in Asylum Cases on the U.S. Courts of Appeals. So scholars and U.S. Supreme Court justices lament the inability of generalist federal judges to effectively control the bureaucracy because they lack needed expertise, but some argue they can acquire the necessary specialization. We enter this debate by examining federal court review of asylum decisions made by the Board of Immigration Appeals and Immigration Judges in the Department of Justice, a salient area of law with widely varying outcomes. We ask, are federal court of appeals judges more likely to overturn agency decisions concerning asylum claims when they are exposed to more immigration cases? This question is important for several reasons. First, it sheds new light on the relationship between agencies and the courts, laying the foundation for future research concerning the extent to which specialized judges can reign in the administrative state. It also provides insight into the influence of judicial experience on decision-making and its relationship to the effects of ideology, which has implications for consistency in judicial decision-making. It also has implications for pressing policy questions concerning the probability that judges sitting on a proposed specialized federal immigration court of appeals would become more likely to reign in the administrative state. For our theoretical approach, we begin with the principle of administrative law, that a key reason for federal court deference to bureaucratic decisions is agency expertise as opposed to generalist judges. According to Chang, the generalist judge is a myth. Judges develop expertise through opinion specialization. Baum adds that judges can also specialize in a field or area of law as a result of a high concentration of such cases. The case concentration dimension of specialization can be likened to the experience concept from Miller and Curry. Miller and Curry distinguish between experience, which is gained while you're on the bench, and um, expertise, which is gained before you ascend to the bench. So something such as ga gaining a degree. They found in patent cases that expertise was significant and it amplified the effect of ideology, but their broad measure of experience, which they measured as years on the bench was not. We argue the influence of specialization should vary by the degree to which the court is expected to defer to the agency because of 
the agency's expertise in immigration on that issue. Specialization is therefore likely to have the largest effect when the applicant challenges an agency finding of fact. In those cases, they defer because of expertise, but they can reverse if it's unreasonable, if the agency's finding is unreasonable. These are usually vague questions of whether or not the applicant has provided sufficient evidence of persecution. By contrast, we uh, argue that specialization is likely to have little or no effect for constitutional questions. In those cases, courts don't defer uh, to agency decisions. We also argue that it's likely to have little or no effect in discretionary matters, such as whether or not an eligible applicant deserves asylum, and often the motion to reopen. Most often in our data set, you see uh, applications for motions to reopen. In those cases, uh, courts defer, but it's a very high threshold, and it, we don't think that specialization is likely to pierce that armor. Specialization could have an effect on statutory or regulatory questions if Chevron deference applies. In that case, if it's an ambiguous statute, they defer if the uh, agency interpretation is permissible or reasonable. But the application of Chevron deference is confused in immigration law. Uh, specifically, if you look at, say, the question of whether or not Chevron deference would be applied to an IJ opinion, if the BIA summarily affirms, I mean, didn't write an opinion. In those cases, there's been discussion of whether or not a lesser form of deference, such as Skidmore deference, which would be a lot of different factors, but primarily, um, is it persuasive enough? Is the reasoning persuasive enough? So we have several hypotheses. First, we expect that when the applicant challenges an administrative fact finding, the probability of vote to remand increases as the judge's level of specialization in immigration law increases. We have two alternative hypotheses for statutory and regulatory interpretation. When the applicant challenges administrative statutory or regulatory interpretation, we expect that the probability of vote to remand could increase as specialization increases, but it also might not be contingent on this level of specialization. We expect that when there's a challenge to a constitutional interpretation, the probability of vote to remand will be not contingent on specialization and the same for a discretionary decision. We also test in hypothesis five, the impact of judicial, the interaction of judicial ideology and specialization. Based on Miller and Curry, we uh, expect that the impact of judicial ideology will increase as the judge's level of specialization in immigration law increases. For our methodology, we employ the Westlaw key number system, which organizes cases by legal issues and topic. We take a random sample of 10% of cases under each key number under the topic of aliens, immigration, and citizenship, only those key numbers for asylum. Uh, at the time of writing the paper, we had uh, we have 1,103, so these results. I've run it, we've, we've gone now to uh, 1,500 cases, and the results are basically the same. Um, and the cases are decided between 2002 and 2017. Our primary in independent variables are specialization, which is uh, the measure of the raw number of BIA appeals heard by the Court of Appeals in that circuit. And then we have dummy variables for whether or not there's a issue raised with regard to a finding of fact, a statutory question, constitutional question, or abuse of discretion. And we interact those with the specialization variable. We also interact with judicial ideology. And then we have controls for several uh, factors that have been shown in prior research to influence both immigration and asylum decision making. So basically, uh, we focused primarily on um, the impact of specialization and finding of fact issues, which is our primary finding. But first, I just want to note that um, in the baseline model, model specialization was significant. It increased the probability of a vote to remand by 7.66 percentage points. But uh, the primary driver here is these finding of fact cases. Um, the interaction of specialization and the finding of fact variable is significant. A standard deviation increase in the specialization variable is associated with an 8.04 percentage point increase in the probability in the vote to remand. The constitutive variables are not significant. So when a finding of fact issue is not present, there's no relationship between specialization uh, and the probability of a vote to remand. Uh, we also note that the finding of fact variable was not significant in the baseline model, so the effect is contingent on the impact of specialization. None of the other interactions were significant, so that provides, provides support for hypotheses 1, 2b, 3, and 4. 
And we don't find any support for hypotheses five. We don't see any relationship between ideology and specialization. So our conclusions are first, the experience type of specialization has a significant effect on the probability that a federal court of appeals judge will overturn the experts in asylum cases, particularly in these finding of fact cases. Exposure to immigration cases appears to be a particularly important factor driving the US courts of appeals judges decisions to overturn the experts when the case involves a finding of fact, which in a lot of the discussion by the court of appeals judges and dissents, they call this usurping the trial court's role. The finding that experience does not increase the likelihood of a remand in cases involving the interpretation of a statute or a regulation has important implications for this ongoing debate concerning the impact of Chevron doctrine. And I will note here that um, we have seen some variation in the results uh, with a 1500 case uh, sample. So we're moving forward with collecting more and more cases. And the finding of fact tends to be this, this finding tends to be a consistent, but we do see variation with the statutory uh, interpretation and then that that sample needs to grow as we move forward and then we can find more conclusively with regard to um, this discussion, particularly with regard to Chevron cases. So, all right, thank you very much. All right, awesome. Thank you so very much, uh, Maureen. Um, our next paper is uh, by uh, Sange Mishra, and it is entitled Radicalization and Racialization Muslim Americans in the Post 9 11 US. All yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I'm not going to be using uh, PowerPoint, so I'll just uh, present my ideas. So, this paper is uh, looking at institutional discourses on Muslims to understand how mainstream political institutions engage with Islam and Muslims discursively while formulating policy frameworks to deal with violent extremism and terrorism. I analyze congressional hearings focused on the phenomenon of radicalization, specifically Muslim radicalization. The hearings analyzed in this paper span the time period between 2002 and 2015 and include committees and subcommittees of the House of Representatives and the Senate. There are a total of 32 hearings in the span of 12 years included in this analysis. The deployment of the term radicalization in congressional hearings has helped produce a particular set of meanings around Muslim identity and sociality. In this paper, I argue that institutional discourses, while they are constrained by constitutional and legal norms of non-discrimination and religious freedom, produce a particular set of meanings around Islam and Muslim identity that constructs a racial identity tied to, tied to group suspicion. I argue that a contradictory and ambiguous discourse on the issue of radicalization in these hearings ends up reinforcing the framework of group suspicion that many members of the Congress in these hearings wanted to move away from. A very quick word about methodology. Uh, this paper employs interpreting method to analyze congressional documents. Drawing upon this method, a close reading of the text is the most important tool to identify the important patterns and themes in these documents. I use racial formation framework to analyze racialization of Muslim Americans. The analysis of congressional documents through this framework allows to look for discourses and meanings that enable institutions to construct the Muslim identities in particular way. Now I'll briefly talk about the findings uh, from the analysis of these uh, congressional documents. Uh, we know that radicalization became a popular term in policy making and law enforcement uh, circles in the US, uh, but there has been a lack of clarity and perhaps that is deliberate as far as the use of term was concerned. The paper is focused on this lack of clarity and how that allows for an expansive meaning of the term. To exemplify this lack of clarity, here's a discussion on the issue of radicalization from one of the committee hearings. This is from the Committee on Homeland Security uh, of the House of Representatives. The hearing was organized in 2006 and it was titled Radicalization, Information Sharing and Community Outreach, Protecting the Homeland from Homegrown Terror. Testifying in the hearing, Brian Jenkins, senior advisor Rand Corporation suggested, and I quote here, Potential jihadist recruits in Western countries are part of a marginalized immigrant subculture or are themselves cut off even from family and friends within that community. 
more vulnerable are those who are at a stage of life where they are seeking an identity while looking for approval and validation. End of quote. The suggestion here is that Muslims who are marginalized from mainstream culture and those who are not fully integrated or assimilated are more, are more likely to radicalize. Thus, what we see is that the pace and nature of assimilation of Muslim immigrants was considered to be uh, an important factor in radicalization. And here is another definition of radicalization proposed by Janice Frederick from FBI's Los Angeles field office. She writes, and I quote here, the FBI characterizes homegrown Islamic extremists as US persons who may appear to be assimilated, but to some degree have become radicalized in the support for Islamic Jihad. They often see themselves as devout Muslims and reject the cultural values, beliefs, and environment of the US, end of quote. The suggestion in this quote is that even those who appear to be fully integrated are likely to be radicalized. So we can clearly see two very different conceptions, but they're overlapping, but different conceptions of radicalization. One emphasizing the fact that the, these are marginalized and non-assimilated individuals. And the other one suggesting that these individuals appear to be assimilated, but they may take a jihadist worldview. Now, these seemingly contradictory conceptions are never resolved in these pro proceedings or in a range of proceedings that I have uh, looked at. To take this a little further, the issue of assimilation and socioeconomic status of Muslims as possible factors in radicalization came up during another hearing in 2006 by a House of Rep Representatives subcommittee called Intelligence, Intelligence Information Sharing and Terrorism Risk Assessment. The hearing was triggered by a major terrorism incident in Canada involving suspects that were Canadian Muslims who grew up there. The members of the Congressional Subcommittee visited Canada to get a first-hand understanding of the problem. The hearing pointed to the Canadian example, suggesting that radicalization might happen in a segment of Muslim population, which is middle-class and well-integrated. The chairman of the subcommittee, Representative Rob Simmons, opened the hearing by talking about his impressions from the visit to the Canadian neighborhood where the suspects lived. And I quote here, we visited the neighborhood, we saw the schools, and these were not disadvantaged individuals. In fact, as we observed the neighborhood, we were told that homes were $300,000 homes. It was an integrated neighborhood, end of quote. Another member of the subcommittee, Representative Dent, pushed this idea further and argued that we erroneously presume that those who get radicalized grew up in, and I quote here, squalid refugee camps, perhaps in the West Bank, but we are witnessing radicalization among individuals who grew up in the West and not necessarily coming from poor or underprivileged background, end of quote. We see this contradictory and ambiguous understanding of radicalization in another hearing that was ex exclusively focused on radicalization among Somalian American Muslims in Minnesota. The hearing was happening in the context of uh, news reports of a Somali American youth, Shirwa Ahmed, who traveled to Somalia in 2008. Uh, he committed a suicide bombing in the northern part of the country. In response to questions from members of Congress about the dangers of radicalization within Somali American community, the FBI representative Philip Mudd said the following, and I quote here, you have a community that comes here in contrast to some other immigrant stories. Immigrant stories, for example, of Indian communities or Pakistani communities, communities with doctors and engineers. These are Somalians, folks who come here because they are escaping great trauma in their home country. They are working here in meat packing plants, poultry processing plants. There is often not a great command in the first generation of the English language among their parents. Again, I want to emphasize that we are not alone in looking at this problem. I want to sign up to what Mr. Lipman said. Here he's referring to another testimony. This is not a community problem. In a sense, we do not have radicalized community communities. We do have radicalized clusters of people, typically youths between, let us say, 17 and above although we have seen efforts to 
radicalize kids as young as 12, 13, 14 years old in this country, end of quote. Uh, the comparison here with India and Pakistani Muslim immigrants was to highlight the relative economic marginality of Somalian Muslims and how that could be a factor in radicalization. In the same hearing, uh, the FBI person went on to say that even though we know that uh, there are clusters of radicalized people within the community, but it is hard for us to predict who that is, right? A lot of people are traveling to Somalia, traveling back to the US, uh, and the community may not be radicalized, but it's hard to predict who the radicalized person is going to be. So in that sense, what you see is a very sort of uh, all encompassing sort of uh, prediction of how to understand radicalization. There are other examples in the paper of ambiguous and contradictory conceptualization of radicalization. And to conclude, uh, the response in these uh, hearings ended up creating a conception of radicalization, which suggests that both assimilated as well as less assimilated, middle class as well as economically marginalized Muslims could be radicalized. These ambiguous and contradictory discourses on radicalization plays a very significant role in racializing Muslim communities in the US and Europe. It allows the institutions and public officials to think about radicalization in a very open, in a very open-ended manner where Muslims of different kinds, poor and rich, assimilated and less assimilated, those with proficiency in English and those without are all potentially inclined to radicalize. I'll end here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Uh, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you to Shane and David and Allison for organizing this event, for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I'm really, really happy that this is happening. And I was thrilled to be able to read these two great papers. Um, I'm gonna start with some comments on the Staub and Kennedy paper. Um, this is a really interesting paper and I think it makes um, a contribution, a real contribution to both the literature on asylum law in the United States and to the literature on the effect of judicial specialization and expertise, which I confess I know less well than, than the literature on asylum law. Um, the authors have done an impressive amount of work to collect and code over a thousand asylum cases and counting, and they use these cases to look at all circuits over a fairly long period of time in order to see whether judges who have had an opportunity to specialize in asylum law through exposure to a large volume of asylum cases are more likely to send cases in which an individual has been denied asylum back to the administrative level for a rehearing. And I'll also just say, I think that the authors demonstrate a real mastery of the relevant literatures in this paper. And there was nothing that jumped out at me that I feel like oh, why didn't they cite um, this, that, or the other? So again, with the caveat that I don't know the secondary literature um, as well as I could, but it, it felt thorough to me. I really like how the paper is trying to figure out where and when specialization matters most by disaggregating the different types of appeals that can take place in an asylum case, not just assuming that all asylum appeals are equivalent. And I view this as one of the biggest contributions of the paper. It really shows that the authors understand asylum as a specialized area of law. So my first and biggest comment is really about how the paper, I, it's, a, it's about the measure of specialization. So um, I guess there's several different ways I could cut at this, but I'll just start by saying, I'm still a little bit confused about exactly what the measure is. And so, um, you know, I tried really hard. I read the paragraph on the specialization variable a lot of times. And please forgive me if I am misunderstanding, <laughs> but um, I am reading it as not actually an individual level variable for each judge, um, but rather it's a circuit level variable because some circuits are more specialized than others. And so I think, you know, first and foremost, if that's true, I think the paper could be more clear about that in the way that it talks about specialization. So um, 
because I know that you want to differentiate from the work of Curry and Miller, which measures um, experience, um, and you want to differentiate specialization from experience because um, the experience measure means that someone with um, 10 years of experience in a circuit that hardly ever hears asylum cases would be counted as equivalent to someone in one of the high volume circuits. And I totally get that. But I'm concerned about the fact that the experience variable seems to fall away here, um, such that a judge that's new to the Ninth Circuit and a 20 year veteran in the Ninth Circuit would be, if I understand the um, paper correctly, would be treated the same. And so if that's true, I guess I'm a little bit concerned that we're, we're not actually able to measure how how an individual judge is going to like learn a lot more about asylum and then change their behavior because all judges in these high, highly specialized circuits are being lumped together. So I guess my ignorant comment is like, how hard would it be <laughs> for you to change the measure to combine the two things and, and have specialization and experience be combined to have an individual level um, measure for each judge? I'm concerned that that's actually very hard. And so if it's not possible, I just think um, instead of changing all your data, you could just maybe reframe the way you speak about your variable. And I think just expanding that, because right now it's just one paragraph, but it's such an important contribution and it's a unique contribution of the paper. Expanding the section where you talk about specialization um, to just sort of talk about it more as an environmental factor that you're measuring, right? Because you can't actually say whether one judge or another is more specialized, but you can say working in a specialized circuit seems to have this very significant effect. And I think that's still really interesting. So without having to change your data, I think you could still say some pretty interesting things about this, but just being more clear about what you can and can, can and cannot measure, I think would be important. Okay. So the second comment I have is a much more general note about framing and tone. And I think it also, I think the first comment that I just made is gonna be something that most people are gonna to wanna to ask you about. And I freely acknowledge that this, the remainder of my comments may be something that's just particularly important to me, <laughs> but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, so the, the paper at times is written in a way that makes some assumptions that I don't think are necessary for the claims the paper's making and that I found distracting. So first, the language of the paper often talks as if there's an actual or like a correct answer in refugee status determination cases. In other words, the idea that every applicant either is or is not a refugee, and it's not clear to me like how that would be true. And I know this is just my personal bugaboo, but it certainly isn't clear to me that the goal of the US refugee status determination regime is to correctly identify people as refugees or not. Um, I find this formulation to be pretty essentialist and it places the judiciary in this position of cutting down the amount of errors that occur in which people who are refugees are denied refugee status incorrectly. And I just think you could frame the paper um, slightly differently to frame judges as gaining substantive expertise that helps them properly review notoriously complex cases for legal errors without having to wade into this topic of what RSD is supposed to accomplish and like how well it accomplishes that. Um, and relatedly, I think at times the paper takes a slightly normative tone, which you know, I'm sympathetic to, but it seems to assume that the administrative agency decisions are, are bad and need to be checked. Um, like for example, you use the phrase reign in the administrative state to describe the role of courts in the paper um, on multiple occasions. And I think to just clarify what you mean here um, it would require you to present just a little bit of the extensive evidence that there is out there um, that the quality of RSD in the United States being offered at the administrative level is very inconsistent. It's notoriously uninsulated from the politics of exclusion. Um, at least that's how I describe it in, in my um, book and judicial review is needed, not necessarily because the administrative agencies are denying people who are refugees, but because 
they're frequently making decisions that are incoherent and which engage in glaring legal errors so that we can't even pretend to be confident in their outcomes. So I just think the paper could be written in a way that steps a little bit back from these assumptions and says, we often think about asylum adjudication in this country as a highly partisan or ideological issue. But actually just becoming more familiar with the task at hand and all of its complexity makes judges either more likely to have concerns about what's being done at the administrative level or at least make them more confident in raising those concerns. And so again, that's a subtle shift in how you talk about things, but I think it would um, make it a little bit cleaner. Um, but overall, I'm really excited about this paper and I think you know it has a lot of potential to get out there in the world, hopefully sooner rather than later. So thanks for sharing it. Thank you so much. Um, now my uh, comments on the Mishra paper. So I think this paper is on such an interesting and important topic. And it, it actually made me stop and reflect on the ways in which Islamophobia and hostility towards Muslims was such a major theme of like a, a prominent theme in US politics for so many years after 9-11 and was a, was a very like, in the forefront of our public debate around immigration. And it of course came back again um, around the Muslim ban, but it's been something that has ebbed and flowed over the past 20 years in terms of whether it's like the um, prominent um, topic of discussion around um, immigration. And, and I think that focusing uh, a paper that really like digs deep into public debates on this topic is, is so important and so needed. And so in order to do this, the paper engages in a discourse analysis of primarily congressional hearings in the 20 years post 9-11 um, in order to present what the author calls an alternative approach to understanding increased hostility towards Muslims. So um, my first comment is just on your data and methods section. So um, the main corpus of data, as I understand it, is 32 hearings in which Congress talks about radicalization. And I just think um, that the methodological section of the paper could have been expanded here to say more about just how you identified and selected these 32. Like, is this the universe of hearings on this topic? Um, or, or a sample, what search terms um, and criteria did you use um, either to ensure that you're getting all of the relevant hearings or a representative sample of them. Um, I would have liked to actually see some over time data here to learn about like, you know, were there periods as I just suggested like that my, I have a hunch here that like there are periods in which this issue gets more attention and then recedes a little bit. Um, is that even true or was I just making that up? Um, or has it been consistently um, frequent in terms of a topic of congressional debate? Um, similarly, the paper says that it considers other key law, law enforcement documents. And so again, I just wanted to hear more about how did you identify those what was your criteria for adding sources to your corpus beyond the congressional hearings? And was that done in a systematic way? Like I just, um, I feel like I would be more confident in some of the claims that you make about this rhetoric if I knew more about, you know, how comprehensive is the world of rhetoric that you are um, analyzing here. Um, my second big reaction was, um, to the framing about your, um, yours as an, what you call an alternative approach to understanding hostility towards Muslims. So I think the paper could just be much more forceful about what your argument is an alternative to, because the literature review section focuses a lot on scholars who write about racial formation and it seems that you, tend to agree with those scholars and are, are building on and joining with them and applying their theories to this particular topic. And so I wasn't so clear 
on what you see as the hole in the literature that you want to fill or to put it a different way. And I, I always like to think about, you know, the ax that you want to grind, right? Like, so <laughs> who are you, who are you mad at? <laughs> like, who do you think is, is understanding this incorrectly um, and, and applying the wrong lenses and concepts to this topic? Um, and I think you could have, um, be a lot more um, like forceful and um, about, is there a misunderstanding in the way scholars have approached this issue that you want to correct? Um, so then my, um, I don't know what we're at now. Third comment is about the presentation of the analysis. So the data is really rich and I learned a lot from reading it and, and the discussion of the hearings was really the meat of the paper. Um, and I was struck reading it by the ignorance on display by many elected officials, um, how much, you know, how little I guess they seem to know both about Islam and the basic realities of being an immigrant in the United States, any theory of assimilation, right? Um, and I was also struck by the assumption throughout, at least by many of the speakers that you identify in your analysis, that there is a type of person who's a terrorist who needs to be identified. To me, this is sort of the flip side of what I was saying um, in my comments about the other paper, right? Uh, of this essentialist view of, a person out there who's a refugee and we're gonna create this regularized system to identify them. Um, and, and a lot of the congressional debates seem to take a similarly essentialist view of, of terrorism, right? There's a type of person out there who's a terrorist who needs to be identified. And I think that this paper would be just strengthened overall if the discussion of the hearings um, that you present was more signposted, sort of highlight some of these themes and say like, so there's this theme about um, assumptions about who terrorists are. There's this theme about lack of knowledge of assimilation or a theme about a countervailing view, which is actually more less hostile to Muslims. I felt like I was pulling out some of the themes and I wasn't always clear whether they were the ones that you wanted us most to focus on, um, which just goes back to, I think, to my original point about throughout the paper being much more clear about um, your ax to grind or like the, the themes that you want to pull to the forefront. Um, and I think perhaps it would be useful to um, move your discussion that's more analytical of the concept of radicalization, which is now like near the end, pages 22 to 24, maybe move it to the beginning to the more of the framing section, because I think if that came earlier, it would help lay out your theoretical framework more. Um, so just two other quick points. One is I wanted uh, to hear a little bit more about a, if there, if in your view was change over time. So has this debate um, evolved over 20 years or has it stayed pretty much the same? And then a couple suggestions on literature. So I just read this book, which, you know, on, on first glance is unrelated because it's about the history of, um, exclusion of uh, Chinese exclusion predominantly, um, also some discussion of Japanese exclusion. Um, I just put it in the, in the chat, but this book does a really excellent job of tracing both exclusionary re rhetoric in American history and the countervailing, what he calls the backlash. And I wonder whether the framing of this book would be helpful for you because I, I felt like that was a strong theme in your analysis as well. This idea that for, um, for every very like ignorant Islamophobic um, slash exclusionary um, speech in Congress, there's someone trying to say something a little bit different. And, and um, I thought um, this Kurashagi book does a pretty good job of really um, not downplaying how strong <laughs> um, anti-Asian exclusion has been in American history, but also tracing out the thread of a countervailing um, force. And then the second book I wanted to just draw to your attention is a brand new volume out called Islamophobia and the Law. And um, apologies if you're already familiar with it, but um, I didn't see it cited. So I thought I'd throw it out here. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it looks like it's, it could be extremely useful to you because it's an edited volume with um, multiple different chapters about um, 
how Islamophobia um, plays out in American politics. And so hopefully if that's not a citation that you were already aware of, it could be helpful for this piece. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Happy to engage further, but also I know there's a, people who came all this way, so. All right, thank you so very much, Rebecca. Um, at this point, we wanna open up the floor to, uh, uh, well, first, uh, if the authors want to respond to any of uh, Rebecca's comments, uh, we'll give you a, a, if you'd like to do so, please go ahead and respond. Thank you. I wanted to, couple things I really appreciate you picking up on. I think that just goes from my experience with BIA and IJ opinions. I think there's this, uh, <laughs> there may be a little bias and perhaps a little anger still left over um, from having practices in their area because I really hadn't noticed that, that I had that. And um, I'm just looking at this, this idea that there's this, uh, you know, and I have your book and I'm thinking about, you know, there's this unnecessary assumption here that we're making that there is, there's not necessarily this correct determination. So really what we'd be saying is we're focusing on the process is what, right, is what you're saying. Focusing on like, can we at least make it look like it's a coherent um, legal, like legally correct in some sense of the word or, or what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what you, yeah. either, I mean- I'm I, semblance I of the rule of law, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you, you differentiated here from ideology, which I found really refreshing and interesting, right? So it's not just the case that judges are weighing in because they have this, you know, desire to grant asylum to more people. It seems more complicated than that. And, you know, it feels nitpicky and I apologize, but I do think that if there's a way to get past the idea that the process is designed to, to discover the correct outcome rather than provide a fair process. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's that's what I, I think that's what you're saying. Like that's my sense of it too, is it's really just about, can we at least provide a fair process because it, it does end up being very arbitrary in a lot of ways, right? And the more, more one learns about it, the more one realizes how many different ways the process can be totally. <laughs> right, right, right. So <laughs> that's one thing. And we've been um, really trying to also in terms of the measure. So it is that circuit level measure and it's only available from 2002 on. Um, and so we've been trying and we had a suggestion um, from a prior person to try to do um, immigration judges using Westlaw. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've gotten a sample going back in time of how many immigration, just in general immigration cases they've heard. So any kind of BIA or IJ opinion they've read, because I think I truly believe that because a lot of this is so mixed together, asylum is part of so many different kinds of claims that if they've read enough BIA and IG opinions, they're going to start to be more heightened of the awareness of that. So I, I did that and um, so far I haven't got enough of that gathered. I think I've only gotten the first, I don't wanna say how many, but the one thing I'm picking up on that is um, it's way undercounting. Like it just logically, my I think I can still use the measure because it's not biased in any way in terms of it's an undercount across the board. But I was just looking at, I, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but just judges who I know serve in certain circuits or like Posner and people like that who you know how many cases they probably saw. And I'm looking and it's like 70 cases over the course of their career. And I'm thinking that's probably yeah. pretty low, right? And that's all immigration, not just asylum. Um, because if I had to, I, I wasn't trusting the narrowing it to the key number with asylum. But it's, it's whether they sat on the panel or not too, not whether they offered the opinion or not too. So I'm using that. But but I don't know if you think the undercounting is a problem. Personally, I was going to go ahead and use it as an individual love measure and just say it's across the board undercounting is basically what I can say. Um, it's like two measures. Here's what if we look at just the individual and here's if we look at the circuit like environmental. I mean, is there a way for you to simplify this and say, you know, first of all, your main, the measure that you have now of like some circuits are more specialized than others is a good measure. But then if you could do more of like a focused like deep dive into just one circuit, like the ninth. Okay. And compare, cause we know that's like the highest one or the second, doesn't matter. Yeah. And um, compare judges who've been there for five years to judges who've been there for 15 or 20. And I know that starts getting really messy because of who's appointed them and all the, but if you, you control for, yeah. uh, says the qualitative scholar, control yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, we can control for that. So Laura, you wanted to say something, I think, sorry. Yeah, so, so I think 
I, I'm really interested in Rebecca's point about this measure. And what I was going to say is that to start with, um, you know, I think there would be an interesting spinoff paper that's at the court level, because I think that, you know, so, you know, I think that there is this kind of like institutional memory and, and kind of norms that adopt, um, that are adopted. And I, you know, I, I also sort of wonder if there aren't, um, the kind of regime effects. So that is when you have, you know, a new attorney general who comes in and appoints a new slate of like IJs, you know, like whether you're, you would see some interesting kind of effects over time. And since this measure is already at the circuit level, mm -hmm. um, I think that you could get very easily circuit measures of ideology. Um, so I think that could be an interesting direction to go. Um, and then in terms of the individual level, um, I think Rebecca has some good ideas about, you know, like maybe just narrow it down to one circuit, you know, all the judges, so you can search by judge name um, mm -hmm. to pull out. And, and I was going to sort of suggest that there could sort of be competing hypotheses with respect to how you're talking about um, specialization, because to me, it seems like a possible um, result of hearing more and more of, I mean, having read a lot of these cases, like coding a million courts of appeals decisions, mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's an extent to which you might sort of accumulate compassion fatigue, right? That they're all just so awful. I mean, the facts are just, you know, really, really rough. And so, um, you know, at a certain point, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's a curvilinear relationship, mm -hmm. um, that happens, um, in terms of your exposure to these cases, um, and I think, you know, that might be something where you could look at, you know, and I think it's a really interesting distinction to think about facts, like how are you evaluating factual determinations as opposed to determinations that are based on, you know, you know statute or, you know, constitutional claims. So I think, I think it's really interesting to kind of parse all that out. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I, you know, if you were able to kind of identify you know, here are people who came onto the court within this window that you know you can get the data for, and then you can go and count all the cases that they have. And maybe you could even do that across circuits, right? If you didn't, you know, that might help with, with the N a little bit, because then you could really see at the individual level, because I think, you know, the argument you're making is an individual level argument. I think there's also a cool court level argument that can be made that's separate. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think you're going to want to have that that individual level variable, or at least some, you know, for some subset anyway, um, to be able to persuade, you know, to get past three reviewers, I think you're going to need to have that. So I, but I think it's just like a really smart paper and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and really important and fills a really interesting gap. So um, I know it's not easy to get through. Um, you've been doing a lot of legwork to collect the data. So I give you, yeah. I give you props for that. <laughs> and we're still, we're, we're sitting here, we're like thinking, let's figure out how many we have left. I think it would make us feel better if we could just like, get an assessment of how many we have left because we thought about, should we cut it down to 5%? Because there's like, so, but I feel better with 10%. So I'm just kind of like, could I just see, um, as my co-author was like, we were like, just, let's just get a number of how many we have. <laughs> so we can, but, uh, but thank you. Actually, I want to think what's probably going to happen um, and we've been tossing this around is hopefully we get this paper out and then we just do a book because I feel like I could write a whole book about this and with all the ideas that you all are, are bringing up I feel like um, there's so many things to explore personally just in the the fact finding in and of itself like what you just mentioned right there like um, I see there's a lot there that I want to play with so and I don't think we need to necessarily count figure out how many immigration cases each of these judges has actually heard mm -hmm. rather I think if there was some way to give them each a score of like mm -hmm. five years in a high immigration circuit counts for way more than five years in a low um, circuit I think would be a shorthand but I, I would be happy with that that would satisfy me okay that's good because it's a real pain to get the in individual uh -huh. <laughs> it took me forever <laughs> It was interesting, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is taking a really long time. From, from where I'm, from where I'm uh, sitting on this one, Marina, I think you, one way you might accomplish this um, is, so if you're, you're noting if they're on a circuit that hears a lot of immigration appeals, 
-hmm. Why not just how long they've been on the bench? Um, if I'm on a circuit that has high immigration, um, uh, high, high levels of immigration cases, and I've been on the bench for 10 years, I've probably been exposed to a higher number than someone who's been on that same circuit for one or two years and just run it as an interaction term. That's what I was wondering, because we only have the so maybe just a, is it a high, come up with a certain threshold and say above this, you're a high and a zero one kind of a thing? No, what, what I would do is, is you're on a, you're on a, 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 you could take like the number of immigration claims per circuit, if you get that, and then get the number of years that that person has been on the bench. And then I'd plot out that interaction. And, you know, if, if that curvilinear effect that, um, uh, that Laura was mentioning is there, uh, you will, uh, you will find it. You will, you will find it that way, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize it. I'd leave it uh, broad, just in a, just so you could uh, capture all the variation to tell the coolest, neatest story you possibly can. Okay, so if I say for the year two thousand eight, the measure for say Posner is how many years he's been on the bench at that point times how many cases were heard in two thousand eight, just as a ballpark kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, you could do that, or you could do like the number, like a running tally of how many immigration cases that that circuit has heard. Um, I would play with them all, you know, what makes the most theoretical sense. Yeah, because we only have from 2002 on, so I don't know um, prior to 2002. That's the biggest limit I have. Um, well, if the, if the data is limited to you, then I mean the data is limited and it's, yeah. uh, or you could use, I mean, if you can it's only- like 20 it. years, that's a lot to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So years by how many years on the bench times just how many they heard that particular year as a ballpark mm -hmm. figure or mm -hmm. I'll play with That's it for 2002 mm -hmm. to 2008 or whatever. Absolutely. <laughs> Can I respond? Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, Rebecca. These are awesome comments and I think uh, they make a lot of sense and they're really helpful. This is a project that uh, I did some work on, then I moved on to other things and I'm coming back to this. So uh, to get these uh, comments, it's, it's really useful. Uh, I'll respond to a couple of things. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, the hearings that I have selected, they are more like universe of the hearing, right? It's not sampling. It's a uh, totality of hearing between the time period that, that I'm looking at, right? And I've made my best attempt to get at all the hearings. It's entirely possible that I missed something, but I think most of them I've got it, right? And things that I, uh, the keywords that I used are radicalization, terrorism, uh, Muslims, homegrown terror, right? These are terms that I used. I know that if, if I use these terms now, I'll come up with something else because the term radicalization is being used in a different context now, right? And so, but in that time period, I think uh, it hit all the hearings that happened on Muslim radicalization. I made sure to, I decided to exclude hearings that were primarily focused on international conflict. So if, if, there, is a, if there is a hearing on the Middle East, if there is a hearing on Afghanistan, which is talking about Muslims, but primarily in that context, I excluded them because they were looking at slightly related, but slightly different stuff, right? So I would say it's, it's more of an universe. Maybe I should go back and see if I have missed something. No, I mean, uh, that sounds very convincing to me um, and like totally satisfying. I, I would just encourage you to go into all of the detail that you just explained in the paper right. itself. Just like literally, I use this many search terms because I think that's the kind of thing at least a lot of reviewers are looking for it so that they're satisfied by your process. <laughs> right, right, right. And um, in terms of, uh, so when I think about this uh, more sort of intellectually and in terms of uh, figuring out the problem or the argument that I'm trying to develop, uh, your question about has it evolved, one of the things that I, I sort of uh, thought about a lot is that whenever they are trying to figure out or come up with a theory of predicting radicalization, right? That's where all the problem uh, problems emerge, right? And so in a way, this article is uh, an attempt to 
question that project, right? That give up that project of trying to come up with a theory which can predict who is going, who is likely to be radicalized and who is the person who is going to get radicalized and what are the ways in which we can understand that, right? So it's a way, it's an attempt to challenge that idea, right? That, that, that whole understanding is deeply flawed. And the moment you try to do that, you are bound to come up with something that is problematic, that is going to target people in unfair, unnecessary ways, right? So that's my sort of intellectual project. I, I don't think it has come across that clearly. So I have to, I have to find literature where people are invested in that kind of project, right? And I have to contrast my argument to their argument. And then because um, racial formation literature is different, right? That's my conceptual sort of uh, tool that I'm trying to lay out and trying to sort of uh, tell my readers that these are, these are the ways in which I'm, I'm coming to this analysis, right? Uh, and, and so much of the discourse is so racist, right? It's like, yeah. who gets radicalized? Oh, the answer is, are they Muslim oftentimes? Yeah. Yeah. Instead yeah. of thinking about all the ways in which yeah. and, we have and, our own homegrown terrorists who are yeah. white. Yeah, and in a way, I, don't, I think uh, both Republicans and Democrats, they were not able to get out of that framework, right? And so even if you are liberal and if you are sort of, um, you are not uh, Islamophobic uh, and you're trying to make sure that Muslims are not discriminated against, the moment you get into that, this framing where you are trying to come up with a way to predict, you kind of get into that kind of framing, right? And so that's that's one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to uh, challenge, right? And your point about uh, an essentialist view of who is a terrorist, right? Or who is a radical, right? That is something that fits into the way I'm looking at it, right? And the last point I want to make is that uh, uh, there were moments when particularly Democrats were Democratic uh, subcommittees or committee committees in the House or Senate were able to move away from this discourse when they called a hearing on Islamophobia, right? And so then the discourse is very different, right? Then their discourse is to think about why is there so much Islamophobia in this country, right? And how are Muslim, Muslims being discriminated, right? And so it's a, it's a switch that they needed. I don't think they were doing it very, very deliberately, but many of the community groups, Muslim organizations, they were pushing them to do different kinds of hearings, right? That how Muslims are being targeted, how Muslims, their civil rights and liberties are being taken away, right? So there is a way in which uh, one can juxtapose those hearings, right? I have not really brought in the hearings on Islamophobia uh, and conversation around that, but there is a way in which uh, after hearing your comments, I think the connections could be made. I'll stop there. I think it's so interesting, this sort of notion of the well-meaning liberal who also falls into the trap. And I, that's why I think that the Kurashagi book might be really helpful to you because even though it's an analysis of 19th, mostly like 19th century congressional debates about Chinese exclusion, one of the major characters in that book is like the, the progressive who speaks against Chinese exclusion, but in ways that are like tragically <laughs> <laughs> racist and filled with misunderstandings, uh, you know, just, um, yeah, very misguided. Um, the, uh, and so I think he does a great job of sort of teasing out the ways in which these debates can feel like two-sided debates, but there's all kinds of assumptions being embedded in them that are worth unpacking. So I don't know if it could be a good model. Okay. All right, I am starting to see questions popping up in the uh, in the comments. So I do want to open the uh, floor for discussion. Um, I think there's, uh, let's just go through, if, uh, just to keep it going, we'll just, I'll just kind of go through the chat. Um, and uh, I see, uh, Arico, am I saying your name right? Uh, yes. Yes. Go for it. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, I, I like both of the, the papers because um, especially with Professor um, Michelle's paper, because I think it's seeing a lot of connections. And Rebecca also mentioned about uh, the Asian Americans, Chinese Americans. And I see um, things becoming more uh, relevant and I see the potential in doing, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, studies on uh, Asian American and Chinese Americans in the recent Congress uh, uh, sessions. I think the questions uh, are more, it's about to see the, because I didn't see, read the pa actual paper. So I'm more concerning about the cultural inference, uh, especially we using the word of radicalizations. So let like I said, a post in the comments saying that, um, I know this is, our, this is a study on the political discourse of the congressional committees and hearings, but I also wondering how these, uh, these discussions actually change, I mean, transits into the formal legal documentations and the policy, uh, the actual policy documentation, especially, and then how these policy further affecting the law enforcement uh, in actually taking places because, um, because you, you, you want to see a channel, uh, you, you want to see the more specific, I mean, more detailed cultural I mean, causal inference or causal mechanism, how these were transferred into the laws and transferred into the, uh, into the, um, the actual policy, I mean, and law enforcement. So I think that's the thing that I am more uh, very curious about, and I hope that Professor can give us more explanation. Mm -hmm. about. Thank you. That's a, um, can I answer? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I've been thinking about that a lot, and and to then go back to Rebecca's question, how did I pick the documents that were coming from law enforcement agencies, FBI and NYPD? Um, the answer to that question, and that relates to then your question, is that uh, uh, some of these documents basically were referred to in the congressional hearings, right? And so many of these experts would refer to. FBI document written in 2003 or NYPD document written in 2005, right? And so I was looking at that and I was aware of some of those documents became, because they became very uh, widely talked about. They became very controversial, right? Uh, on the question of causation, there's a little bit of uh, difficulty in actually making a very clear argument because uh, I'm not, so to me, it seems like some of these concepts emerge first in the law enforcement circles, right? So FBI comes out with a document on how to define radicalization, right? They're calling it uh, in consultation with social scientists, historians, but uh, if you look at the document, it's very clear that, um, that basically, uh, people in their terrorism cell, they, they sat down with some, with some amount of expertise and they wrote a document, NYPD, similar thing, right? And so what you're seeing is that uh, they, they create a very shoddy, uh, very half-baked conception of uh, uh, how to think about radicalization. Uh, some of it is coming from Britain, some of it is coming from other European countries where this debate is, is very intense, right? And they're taking those and they're creating documents and they're creating theories. And now when congressional uh, committees are doing hearings, they are likely to call upon the people who wrote those documents, right? And so you see a very interesting back and forth between law enforcement documents and congressional hearings, right? So it's very hard to then uh, make an argument that uh, the discourse that emerges in Congress leads to a particular kind of law enforcement practice. One can make the argument that perhaps it's the other way around. They started uh, developing some of the law enforcement practices in New York City, in uh, um, certain areas of Michigan, um, California, and then they started writing and then they travel to Congress, right? So I'm not, I'm not very sure how to how to theorize this. I, I can say that uh, perhaps I need to show this back and forth uh, between um, FBI, uh, NYPD, LAPD, uh, major agencies that were involved, and Congress, and this 
uh, what is happening with this back and forth and what is the dynamics? I wanted to say that, you know, something that might be helpful to you, given your time period, because you, this is what, 2002 to 2015, is that right, right for these yeah. hearings? So um, my understanding is, this is from news accounts, not really from scholarship, but but within during the Obama era, there was this internal debate, I think in the first term that happened as there was initially there was like a report that came out that was about um, white um, homegrown terrorists um, and recruitment of um, military veterans um, recruitment and you know maybe law enforcement circles. Um, and it was particularly the, the recruitment of, of folks out of the military that got a really big backlash, as I recall. And so then there was this internal debate within the agency itself about what it was going to prioritize. And my understanding is that this was contentious within um, the DOJ, um, but ultimately what they ended up focusing on was radicalization and focused on Muslim radical radicalization. And so there might be a way that um, and I, like I'm trying, I, I, it's possible this was like a New York Times article or something like that, but it's not, this was not a, you know, um, an academic study, but you could kind of position, because I think there's, there's kind of this, what you're getting at is there's like this deliberate choice to talk about this issue in this particular way. Um, and the language is really slippery. So we start out by saying like, well, it's because there's a type of person who hasn't assimilated, but then we have an example of something that happens and we say, well, they were assimilated. So it can happen here too. So there's this way in which the the, the label that we're assigning is so slippery as to have no meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, pot potentially if you, you might be able to link, you know, debates even within an administration about whether, you know, whether to try to, to use that, that, that term to understand um, other kinds of individuals, um, and that might put a, that might help you kind of um, address, you know, what Shane had put in the chat, which is that, like, you know, if we're talking about radicalization now, you know, there's different kinds of people, and perhaps if there was a hearing, those would be talked about in a different kind of way. Um, but I think it's, I think it's really interesting, and I think, you know, even if you're looking over time, and I, I mean, you may be able to see how language is shifting based on incidents that have just happened, right? So we're saying it's about people who aren't assimilated until this incident happens. And now we have to say it could be if you're assimilated or you're not assimilated, right? And so um, I think having that time dimension <clears throat> might help you make that argument. Right. No, thanks for that. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, I think in, in many ways since uh, uh, mm, uh, radicalization among whites, uh, and insurrection post January 6, all of that has created a different kind of conversation on radicalization, right? And so there is a way in which uh, some of the debates that you are referring to uh, in Obama administration, I think I can I can draw upon that. And, and there are ways in which I think uh, mm, how, how they're approaching even uh, the current debate on radicalization is kind of informed by what they did uh, with Muslim groups, right? And so, and not necessarily in a good way, right? And so one of the things that I have noticed is that uh, uh, they came up with what they called uh, fusion centers, right? And so basically the idea was that fusion center would bring um, FBI, local police, community police. So basically uh, bring all information in one place, right? So that you can, uh, that sounds very efficient, but Muslim communities did realize that it means that lot more surveillance, right? Because LAPD is now constantly in conversation with FBI, in conversation with uh, in, uh, immigration enforcement, right? And so they really challenged that and they really pushed back against that, right? And what we are seeing now is that uh, in, in, con in contesting white radicalization, they are proposing similar things, right? That uh, we need to have these uh, um, agencies where all these agencies can come together and share information, right? And so you have much more surveillance, right? And so there are ways in which parallels can be drawn. Some of them are uh, really disturbing, but uh, yeah, thank you.
One thing I wonder about on that to build on what Laura just said is so you know you think um, you, you think about like you know when you see some kind of uh, you know incident, some kind of like uh, terroristic event or shooting. You know we we have that language of the you know well radicalized person versus you know disturbed young man, typically depending on race or religious background. And I'm thinking you know like if we're talking about you know like insurrectionists. So yeah, sure, the FBI is surveilling, you know, um, the Michigan militia and stuff like that. But when it gets to the floor of the Congress, are we going to use the language of, well, these criminals are amassing AK-47s and they're planning to kidnap the governor of Michigan? Or are they saying this is a terroristic plot? Like, are, are, it's kind of, I, I think it might be worthwhile to, you know, to look not just simply at the surveilling, but when those reports appear in front of the members of Congress, when they, you know, talk about it in the hearings, what language framework are they are they using? Um, and just my naive, you know, kind of approach is I, I would suspect there's some pretty big differences depending on who the um, who is under uh, who who is the subject of the hearing. No, absolutely. I mean, there is there is no doubt about that. There is. There's a lot of dehumanizing which happens of the category of Muslim itself. There is a lot of fear of unknown, right? That 9-11 uh, uh, happens, something that we had not imagined, right? And so you're constantly being asked to think about those uh, unthinkable things that can happen, right? So the fear of unknown, dehumanizing, all of that creates a very different kind of conversations. Uh, when you're talking about Islam and Muslims, right? And it is interesting because Michigan uh, case is throwing up interesting questions because BuzzFeed has this long piece where they talk about how FBI had planted a person and that person actually, now they're they are claiming, the defendants are claiming that, uh, that it, it, it's a case of entrapment, right? And in so many Muslim cases, uh, you have, same pattern, but nobody has been able to claim entrapment, right? So it will be interesting to see how, how they talk about it. But uh, yes, absolutely. I agree completely. Beautiful. All right. Let's see what the chat's doing right now. Um, all right. Uh, would anybody else, uh, anybody else like to jump in on, on either paper? All right. Uh, hearing none, I think uh, I think we have come to the conclusion. This was a fantastic panel. I want to thank um, thank both of our, uh, the authors of both of our papers. I want to thank uh, Rebecca uh, for discussing, and I want to thank the audience for uh, a great discussion. Um, we are going to take a brief break uh, from the uh, brown bags, but we will be back with a new slate of them uh, later in the fall semester. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your uh, rest of your Thursday, and this will be on the Law and Courts website uh, later today, uh, in case you want to replay or share it with someone who wasn't able to make it. Thank you Thanks so much for organizing you. this. Yes, great. thank you so much. This has been extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You.